I'm happy to announce that March 1st is the official release date of the New Thinking Aloud magazine's first quarterly issue. You can download free PDF copies from the website of the New Thinking Aloud Foundation. If you like a high-quality printed edition as a collectible, you can order it from magcloud.com. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove Hello and welcome. I'm Emmy Vadness, co-host with Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is is Resilience in Dangerous Times. My guests are Andrew Harvey and Carolyn Baker, who co-authored the book Radical Regeneration, Sacred Activism and the Renewal of the World. Andrew Harvey is the founder and director of the Institute for Sacred Activism, a religious and mystical scholar, Rumi translator, and spiritual teacher. He is author of more than 30 books, including the Way of Passion, A Celebration of Rumi, The Direct Path, Creating a Personal Journey to the Divine, Using the World's Spiritual Traditions, and The Hope, A Guide to Sacred Activism. Carolyn Baker works closely with the Institute for Sacred Activism. She is a former psychotherapist, psychology and history professor, and writes the Daily News Digest, she is author of several books, including Undaunted, Living Fiercely into Climate Meltdown in an Authoritarian World, Dark Gold, The Human Shadow in the Global Crisis, and Collapsing Consciously, Transformative Truths for Turbulent Times. Andrew is located in Oak Park, Illinois, and Carolyn is in Boulder, Colorado. Now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Andrew and Carolyn. It is such a joy to have both of you with us on New Thinking Aloud today. Lovely to be with you. Thank you for having us. We're happy, very happy to be with you. Thank you. Well, you two have been working for decades in the area of really saving our world, our planet. How can we live resiliently in dangerous times and in an age of extinction? Well, I would like to just, first of all, um, after thanking you for having us, um, just kind of tease apart that word resilience. Um, because being resilient means that it's not only possible to survive or endure the daunting chaos and collapse of our world, but we can actually engage with it in a way that encourages us to learn, grow, and even thrive in the midst of chaos. So this isn't just resilience, it's transformational resilience. And sometimes, you know, people approach what we're dealing with um, as as victims, like, oh my God, this is so horrible, this is happening to us, I don't know what to do, so I'm not even going to think about it. Um, and I like the quote by Stephen Jenkinson, who says, we live in a dangerous time. We can either think of that as an affliction or as an assignment. And so Radical Regeneration, the book that we're going to be discussing today, offers the tools that we need for engaging consciously with this assignment. Andrew, is there anything you want to share about how we can be resilient in this time where it seems that many, including yourselves, feel that the planet we know is really transforming into something that's yet to be discovered? I think what Carolyn has said is very profound. And I'd only add that for me, resilience is a mystical quality. It's a quality that is born when you are revealed to yourself in the depths of authentic mystical experience. And when you are revealed to yourself, you're not revealed as the rag bag of karmic traumas that you often identify yourself as. 
you reveal to yourself as a being whose essential nature is light consciousness, who is one with the consciousness that is creating all things. And that revelation isn't a mental revelation alone. It's a revelation that takes place in the whole of the being. And it's a revelation that gives tremendous calm and very profound joy. And it's that calm married to that joy that creates the kind of rugged, no-nonsense, practical, daily commitment to creativity and to sacred action that is resilience resplendent. So the marriage of our minds and hearts that have created radical regeneration is a marriage of all Carolyn's wisdom and all my wisdom about resilience. And I think that between the two of us, we've created this hybrid person, Carol Andrew, who gives both the tools and the exaltation that we're going to need to stay joyful in the middle of horror. All the greatest teachers and leaders have told us with one voice, one very important lesson, which everyone needs to learn now. And I first learned this through my father, who had a great love of Churchill. And one day he was trying to talk to me about leadership when I was about 10 or 11. And he played me Churchill's speech to the English at the moment when the English were tremendously endangered. And Churchill said what no American politician would say. He said, I have nothing to offer you but blood, sweat, and tears. But I tell you that if they invade, we will fight them. We will fight them in the valleys, and we'll fight them on the hills, and we'll fight them in the streets, and we will never surrender. And my father said that is great leadership, because on the one hand, it's telling people exactly what the situation is. And on the other hand, it's saying by the nobility and the grandeur of how it said, it's saying, this is an appalling situation, but you have great qualities within you, which this situation is going to call out. And I am calling them out of you. And I am modeling them and I am representing them so that you can know just how brave and magnificent you really are. That's the tone of our book. It's a Chichilian book in that sense, because on the one hand, it says to people, nothing is going to be served by pretending that this is just a normal crisis. It is not a normal crisis. It's an unprecedented evolutionary dark night. The second thing it's saying is the way through the dark night is not around it, but through it. And it has very deep lessons that if we can learn them will mean that we won't end the experiment, but we'll begin a completely new experiment, having learned the lessons that only a drastic dark night can teach, a lessons that end our narcissism, lessons that make clear the depth of interdependence between all beings, lessons that really draw on the deepest divine qualities in ourselves and makes us, make us a bit conscious of how creative we can be when those qualities are resplendent. And the third thing that we're saying is, look, you're not a victim. You're a being in radical evolution. The terms of this evolution are known. They're known in the great mystical systems. They're known in the mystical understanding of the dark night and in what you require to get through the dark night. Patience, faith, deep commitment to uncovering your divine nature, trust. If we can model those, the worst of situations can turn out to be the birth canal of the best of possibilities. 
Are you too optimistic about the future? Well, I, I think optimism is cheap. No, sorry, darling. <laughs> Please. I refuse to classify myself as one or the other. Um, I hold both. Uh, I hold the field of possibility alongside um, what appears to be an absolutely daunting situation um, that, uh, you know, that science is telling us, not, not teachers, not gurus, but science is telling us is um, virtually impossible to pass through, you know, and survive. So, you know, I'm holding the tension of those opposites, as Carl Jung uh, spoke of, holding the tension of the opposites. And that way I don't get off into despair, nor do I get off into uh, some kind of false hope or, um, as Andrew sometimes says, oming and shmoming, uh, you know, into um, optimism, whatever that is. I love what Carolyn said. I would say that being an optimist in a situation like this is idiotic. Being a pessimist in a situation like this is also idiotic. It's far too bad to be pessimistic about. What's essential is to cultivate the qualities that we stress again and again in the book. And those are qualities of what I think both of us would call realism. And when you confront the real, you need to do so from both sides of your humanity and divinity. From your humanity, you confront the real and you feel the agony of it. You don't hide. You feel the madness, the agony, the chaos, the sorrow, the unbelievable corruption and injustice. You allow yourself to feel them. From the divine side of yourself, you understand through grace that very frightening situations can also be the necessary birthing grounds of very extraordinary new possibilities. There is no great new creation without the destruction of the old. There's no resurrection without crucifixion. And when you truly meditate with your whole being on that, you develop what I call and we call in the book, birth eyes. So I find myself in the situation very much like Carolyn. I know perfectly well we're capable of destroying everything quite soon. I know also that amazing things are arising right now that prove that a great birth is possible. Think of the Iranian women revolutionaries, the first woman-led revolution in history, risking their lives at 17 and 18 to end that demented vision of Islam. Think of the enormous sacred work that has been done in America through radical opposition to the fascist lunacy of Trump, the way in which people rose up, came together, and are coming together to demand real change. It's still not here, but they're there fighting every single day. And I could go on and on. So when you ask me if I'm optimistic, I'm not going to reply to that question, but what I'm going to say is that I have both eyes, and I feel that the responsibility of an elder mystical teacher is to do two things, which is what we have done in this book. On the one hand, to warn and say, stop pretending. Don't buy the New Age garbage. It's all going to be fine. You don't have to do anything. Don't buy any of the solutions that are being proposed. They're not going to work. And the second thing is to say, that's not a disaster, because when you discover your authentic nature and how it can be guided beyond anything you can imagine by the intelligence that guides and creates all things, then you'll realize that the end that's appearing 
is also a door into an unimaginable new beginning, which we can relate to and we can already see the fragile beginnings of. I would just like to add to that um, my emphasis again on being proactive. And one of the things that we must do is look at this crisis and say, what has been my part in creating it? And then we go and inside, we have tools for this in our book, we go inside and we do the shadow work that needs to be done. Not beating ourselves up, not having a guilt trip all over ourselves, but really working with the shadow because in that shadow lies tremendous potential for transformation and healing and becoming the kind of person that we're talking about, not only resilient, but compassion, compassionate and loving. And so the shadow work is a really necessary part of how we need to respond to the crisis. And it's not just compassionate and loving, is it, my darling? It's also skillful, because when you face your own cowardice, your own corruption, your own collusion with this disaster, you understand at a very deep level why people are so paralyzed and frightened and so willing to embrace completely insane philosophies of denial or of fascism, whatever their potential solution is. And that gives you so much more skill with how to deal with people. You don't deal with them blaming them, accusing them, making them feel ridiculous. That just creates more resistance. You find ways through this much richer, deeper, more compassionate intelligence to reach out to people and speak to them where they are and help them see that what they're offering themselves is not as beautiful and as powerful as what we hope to be able to offer them through this book, a, a real path through inwardly and outwardly. It's a very difficult job, but it's possible to continue to do it with joy, as I think both Carolyn and I represent. Isn't that how we got here in the first place, is that Many people are choosing to not face their shadow. Many people are feel the weight and the gravity, the heaviness of this. Um, even thinking about this, reading your book, one can feel great despair and even denial because it's just really can just crack you open to the depths of yourself. But isn't that the point? Right. That is what a dark night is there to do, to crack you open to the depths of yourself. And one of the things we devoutly hope for this book is that it will help people reduce their terror at being cracked open. Because again and again and in different ways, using many mystics from many traditions, poetry, stories, we show that being cracked open is the thing we most fear but also the thing that can help us the most become truly authentic human beings and fully alive with the joy of being here and being able to reach out to our fellow human beings into the whole animal world and say, I will do whatever I can to protect your life and to help in this situation. And Carolyn and I know how transformative that is because we've been doing it for 20 years and we've been through horrific experiences with both of us we've suffered greatly but those horrific experiences and that great suffering have not led to misery and pessimism and dismissal of humanity it's led to us spending five years of our lives getting as clear as possible a massive four-part mystical symphony for the world, radical regeneration, in which we have laid out as clearly and as kindly as we can exactly what's happening and exactly what's required. So the very book itself is a manifestation of What's born when you allowed yourself to be cracked completely open? What's born isn't insanity. What's born is a radical new plan for the birth of a new 
humanity. We couldn't have been shown what we've been shown without being shattered. So we know that being shattered isn't the end, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of real knowledge and real insight. There's a great Sufi mystic, Ibn Arabi, who says you don't know anything before the dark night. Before the dark night, you think you're in control. You think that just by being mildly good and sending off checks to the Sierra Club, you're going to somehow avert disaster. You think that just by voting Democrat, that that will solve it. A dark night makes absolutely obvious to you that all of the solutions that you're proposing, all of the fantasies that you're keeping alive, all of the forms of denial that you're dancing with, they're all hopelessly bankrupt. That induces two things. Terror, on the one hand, oh my God, terror laced with guilt because you realize just how deluded and fantasy ridden you've been. And then it also induces what is real. The question emerges, but at a fundamental visceral depth, what can I rely on? What is real? What can be seen to be true in a world of burning lies? And that puts you on a spiritual search far more intensely than just being happy will ever do for you, because you've got to find the real to keep going at all. And that's part of the divine intention in this extreme crisis, to take people out totally of their comfort zones, to take people away from their false beliefs, their false and very self-serving and narcissistic beliefs, both about themselves and about God and about human nature, not to punish people, but to give them a savage grace, a tremendous opportunity, which only apocalypse can give, of finding who you really are, what the world really is. And with the dazzled awe of that discovery and the joy, working tirelessly to birth a new way of being out of the old. I keep coming back to, we are not victims no. in this crisis. Um, and I think that's our first reaction. You know, as we feel the fear of how the magnitude of the crisis, you know, it's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, how am I going to deal with this? Well, I just won't. I won't look at it. And the challenge is the challenge that we put out in our book and so many of the people we respect put out is, OK, so what is my work? What is my work going forward with this crisis? You know, and not to think that I have to change the world or that we need a certain number of people to change the world, but to bring it down into the small space of our own lives. In my world, how can I make a difference? What am I being called to do? What am I being called to be, too, isn't it? Two questions I consistently come back to is, who do I want to be in this crisis? And what did I come here to do? And who do you want to be in this crisis, Carolyn? And what do you feel you've come to do? And I'd, I'd love to answer that question too, because I think this is something that you and I have explored at the most fundamental level. You're 75. You've been pouring yourself out for decades. Who do you want to be for us and for this time? Who I want to be is the most awake person possible and the most compassionate person possible. Um, I want to do the work that the crisis is asking me to do, starting with looking at my own shadow and then going from there to what is calling me around me. What is, how, who am I called to serve? Um, whether that's, uh, you know, disabled people or whether that's animals or whether that's a certain patch of ground. Um, and to get done with the grandiose stuff of, well, I've got to be Greta Thunberg and go out there and change the whole world. Uh, rather, you know, what is my world and what does my world need? And how can I be present in it and make a difference in it as a healing presence? Um, 
in, in the midst of the horror. And you, Andrew, how would you answer the question you proposed? Well, I love what Carolyn said. I would, I would love to say what she said, but I think for me, I'm 70. I'm just survived a, a year of very bad sciatica. So I really confronted my mortality. And what I want to be in these remaining years of my life is a beacon of improbable joy and encouragement. I want to be someone who, whatever happens, people can rely on for love and encouragement and for the witness of a joy that doesn't depend upon anything because it is the essential nature of my true self, your true self, and the nature of God. So as things get madder, I want to get saner. As things get more miserable, I want to become more joyful. As things become more paralyzed, I want to be vibrating, orating, creating on every level just to show anyone who's listening or looking that it there's another way of living this. And it can be lived with abandoned love, creativity, joy, and rugged truth. How can we face our shadow and also be with joy? That's an excellent question. <laughs> I love that. We, we had a lot of wonderful discussions about precisely this because mm -hmm. the first book we did was a book about joy. Because we, we are so tired of being called gloom merchants. Because Carolyn and I are two of the most joyful people we both know. We know each other's joy and we know each other's love, which is also a form of joy. So we said, let's annoy them by writing a book on joy. And then we had these amazing lists of what gives you joy. And then one of the categories we came up to choose was the joy of working with your shadow. It's not all misery, what you discover mm -hmm. in your shadow. One of the things you discover in your shadow, for example, I mean, I, not that I have a shadow, I'm just thinking what people I know, is that <laughs> you discover that you're as idiotic as everybody else and that you have the same failings, the same corruptions, the same stupidities. And that can be very shaming for the ego, but after a while, you begin to think, well, that gives me so much more skill, so much more compassion, so much more true fellowship with my fellow crazies, What, which is a source of joy, a real joy. You shall bless your crooked neighbor from your crooked heart. That's one of the great discoveries of shadow work, that it doesn't, when you discover your own limitations, it gives you massively more skill and more compassion for the limitations of others. And that leads to very much sweeter, deeper, more joyful, more kind, more compassionate, more forgiving relationship. For decades, I've been a student of Carl Jung. And one of the things that he says about the shadow, and I think he was probably the first person in Western civilization to really talk about the shadow. But one of the things he emphasizes is that it's not all dark. No. We all have a bright shadow. Those parts of us that we had to send away early on that are beautiful and loving and powerful. And in doing shadow work, we get in touch with the bright shadow as well as the dark shadow. And that can help us be much more present and useful and compassionate in the crisis. So, we go into shadow work and we accept whatever we find. And I'd like to say something about joy because in our first book, which is the first part of Radical Regeneration, um, we talk about reclaiming joy. And there is not much talk in this culture once in a while, but not really much talk in this culture about joy. It's all about happiness, 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 happiness. And mostly happiness in this culture has to do with stuff. Owning stuff, spending money on stuff, 
going to places where we get more stuff. Um, and that's all circumstantial. You know, I took a vacation in the middle of winter, so I'm happy. Um, I got a new, I bought a new house, so I'm happy. I've got a new boyfriend, so I'm happy. And on and on and on. Then when those things go away or subside, then we need something else for the happiness fix. Joy is something that lives at our core. Um, great people in history who have suffered enormously, like Viktor Frankl, like the Dalai Lama, are people who have discovered at their core this joy, even when they were very unhappy. And so Return to Joy, our first section of the book, is about how we access that joy within ourselves, because it's a spiritual quality, but it's always there. We can always access it regardless of circumstances. And it's more than a quality. It's a power. Because if you can access that joy, it gives you access to the creativity of the universe. It gives you access to wholly unsuspected depths of new energy. So one of the really important aspects of accepting this crisis as an assignment is accepting, too, that your greatest assignment in that assignment is to discover joy for yourself in yourself. Because when you do, you will be able to be there for everyone else, whatever happens. One of the things that you can see quite clearly, at least I feel I can see quite clearly, when I'm watching Zelensky, for example, speak and talk. Zelensky is leading a country that is being massacred and broken and tortured beyond belief. Yet whenever he comes out, he radiates strength and he radiates love and he radiates gratitude for the heroism of his people. And he radiates what you can only call a joy in finding in himself the strength that he's found to lead the world in a fight for democracy. So it's that presence in Zelensky that breaks people's hearts open and gives people the sense that, yes, Despite everything, the Ukrainians can actually do this with this kind of human being, leading them and expressing their own deepest nature. Obviously, Zelensky is doing it on a global scale, but I think we're all being called to be Zelenskys in our private world, to be the person who says, it's dreadful, we're going to find a way through, let's howl, let's get together, let's pray, let's love the heaven and hell out of each other, let's help each other, and let's, for God's sake, ensure that Donald Trump never becomes president again, that the fascists don't win. That's joy. And I also would like to add, you know, um, because sometimes as an introvert, I forget this, that to do any of this work that we are offering in Radical Regeneration, we need each other. Oh, yes. As the crisis deepens, um, we have not one hope in hell to survive or thrive without each other. You know, what happens when there's a natural disaster? We see it all the time. When there's a forest fire, when there's a, a tornado that people are thrust together helping each other and 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 really not being able to survive unless they do so in our work we offer support we offer ways that people can network with others so that they're not trying to do this gargantuan work on their own what would you say to someone who may be listening thinking oh, I work two jobs, I'm a single parent, I can barely get enough sleep to even do my jobs and take care of my children or whatever responsibilities they have. This just feels so overwhelming to me. I can't even deal with this. 
Well, the first thing I would say is that I completely, absolutely, finally, deeply, profoundly understand and I get it. The second thing I would say is you know that that isn't an adequate response. You can't bring up your child and be blind to what your child might be brought up into. So let's look at ways together in which you could feel more support in the core of your life. Little moments of time in your day when you could focus on a relationship with the divine in whatever way you understand it. Moments in your day when you can recollect yourself and really commit yourself to doing whatever you can in your ordinary life to help whoever you can from a renewed place of spiritual depth. Let's look at those and start there. And you'll find, I've, I've had the occasion to do that quite often, and you'll find that when people are really seen and heard in their desperation and then given clear help, they will discover themselves that they have more agency, more power, more capacity for creativity than they ever imagined, and then they'll get hooked. And who knows what will happen then. I have a, a friend, at least she's an acquaintance, and she... She was a Minnesota housewife, and she saw that the cheetahs in Namibia were being destroyed, and she suddenly said to her husband, I'm going to save the cheetahs. And he laughed, and he said, my darling, you can't possibly save the cheetahs. She said, you watch me. So she said, I'm, I love you, but I'm going to Namibia. So she went to Namibia. She didn't have any money. She just had a passion. And 10 years later, there are more cheetahs in Namibia than there were 50 years ago, because of one person's decision not to be paralyzed, to follow her passion and her heartbreak, and just to go for it. One of the things that you discover when you take a decision like she did, or a less dramatic one in the core of your life, is that the universe has been waiting for you to take that positive decision and will feed you a great deal of grace and energy once you've made it and open doors to your creative activity in walls that you thought were impenetrably thick. But you have to discover that. And that's why the mystics are so important, and that's why this book is so deeply weighted with spiritual truth, because it's in the spiritual truth that these possibilities born out of difficulty are most marvelously displayed. And I would say to that, to that person who's so weighted down with those responsibilities, um, one thing that anyone can do under any circumstances is to look for and practice gratitude. Mm. Yes, I'm weighted down with these responsibilities, but I have a job. Um, I have this beautiful child or children. And when we, this is, this is from David Stendhal Rast, who's just one of the most wonderful Buddhist teachers and, and a Christian Buddhist teacher who says, whenever we give thanks, we are acknowledging a relationship. So when I give thanks for my job, I'm not giving it to my employer necessarily. I'm not giving it to the president. I'm giving it to the universe. I'm giving it to the sacred. The same with, you know, anything that I'm grateful for. It allows me to be present with that thing and acknowledge that there's something greater than my rational mind and my human ego, that I am blessed with these opportunities, with this love and this support in my life. And let that gratitude then take you. It will take you somewhere. It will take you to some place in yourself that can support doing some of or much of the work that we're talking about in the book. Beautiful. You reference in your book that we are in the Kali Yuga and you talk about Kali with the powers of death and rebirth. Can you share more about that? Yes. 
Well, this is the key to everything. That's why we put it twice, in fact, in our book in different ways. The great mystical philosophers of the East have known that this time would come, and they've described it very, very clearly. And they've known that it would be a time in which the dark feminine, with its power of destruction and rebirth, would be shamelessly dancing in everything, exposing all the shadows, destroying the four systems, annihilating in a very spectacular way. And what they've also known is that this can go two ways. And we make that clear in the book. They've known that it can lead to total destruction. Or if people are reverent enough to the inner meanings of the destruction and can find the spiritual strength to understand the destruction as essential to liberation, essential to being freed of illusions that are keeping you trapped, then a completely different outcome is possible in Kali Yuga, which is nothing less than the birth of a new kind of human race, embodied divine human race, working with great reverence with Kali, not fighting against her. You don't have any chance of beating Kali when she's dancing get with her program and she'll reveal to you the astounding beauty and possibility hidden within the destruction and give you the strength to work with that to become a midwife warrior of the new. So the Hindu mystics, and, the, and I believe them, and there's so many different versions of this particular myth, all of which point to the same reality. What they say is that the very worst of times is actually the best time for your liberation because in a time like this, all the fantasies you might have about being spectacular, rich, fabulous, thin, living forever, all of them are revealed as completely absurd. So you won't get hooked on illusion if you let this time burn away all of your illusions. You'll be released into something far more spacious, far more regenerative. That's why we call the book Savage Grace, because Kali is the bringer of a savage grace. A grace that's savage because it annihilates, but a grace that is enormous also because it annihilates, because it shows you what you cannot afford to be aligned with anymore, and then offers you a wholly new set of radiant possibilities to incarnate and devote yourself to. I tend to be a person of fewer words than Andrew. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that we really try to um, emphasize in Radical Regeneration is the combination of the hospice worker and the midwife. Yeah. A word that we didn't use that's now quite common is doula. Many people are training to become deaf doulas. And so we're saying, you know, become, become a willing to be a hospice worker, but also a midwife because both are taking place. So much is dying and so much is crying out to be reborn or born for the first time. So to hold in your heart and body the doula midwife perspective. Mm -hmm. So if enough people face their shadow, embrace the depths of joy, and we are reborn collectively in humanity, what is the vision the two of you see? What is that high vision that could actually happen? I don't know that it's about enough people. I think we have this misconception in Western culture that we have to have a certain amount, you know, the hundredth monkey garbage, you know, um, if we have a certain number of people, we can change all this. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that that's really so. Um, there's evidence on both sides. Um, but I do believe that we need to hold in our hearts that both things are happening at the same time. And I would say that this rebirth 
whether it happens on a massive scale or with a, just a few people. It's all about discovering for the first time the depth of our humanity, which is also the depth of our spirituality, who we are as human beings and as spiritual beings. And you can, you know, you can go with that saying, we're, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. We are also human beings having spiritual experiences. Both are true. Both are valid. And so this transformation is about discovering at a deepest, the most, the deepest possible depth who we truly are as human beings and as spiritual beings. If we had a comprehensive vision of what's going to be born, we'd be lying. Because what's going to be born out of this extraordinary crisis is something that we can have glimpses of. And I think we could make all kinds of suggestions. We'll have a world in which we treat animals as holy. We'll have a world in which there will be no poor because they'll be supported and sustained. We'll have a world in which everybody will get deep education, including sacred education. We could make certain propositions like that. But the reality is the world that we could create out of what we discover through being shattered open by the dark night could be immeasurably more amazing than anything that we can imagine at this moment. Because everything that we imagine at this moment is born from the consciousness that we have at this moment. And that consciousness is going through a divine shredder to be remade in a completely different way and to provide fuel for creativity that we can't even begin to imagine yet. Trust that. Hope for that. Work for that. Rumi, before his dark night, could never imagine that he would be the greatest prophet poet in the world the world has ever seen. He was a decent scholar. He wrote some really quite bad poetry, gave good lectures. And then he went through the dark night. And then what happened was an eruption of thousands of odes and a whole new vision of humanity. That's what's going to happen to those who go through the process. It's a quantum leap. Andrew, what would Rumi say about what's happening right now? <laughs> well, he would say, the grapes of my body can only become wine after the winemaker tramples me. I surrender my body like grapes to his trampling so my inmost heart can blaze and dance with joy. And although the grapes go on sobbing blood and screaming, I cannot bear any more anguish, I cannot bear any more cruelty. The trampler stuffs cotton in his ears and says, It is I who am the master of this work. You can deny me if you want. God knows you have every excuse. But when, through my passion, you reach perfection, you will never be done praising my name. Very beautiful. That's the message of Rumi to us all at this moment. Carolyn, did you want to say something? I'm speechless after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what is sacred activism? Sacred activism is essentially the birthing force of a new world. And what it is, is a marriage at the deepest level of the two noblest impulses in human nature. The mystic's passion for God and the activist's passion for justice. We've separated those passions. They've been separated by the patriarchy that suspects that if you bring them together, the passion for reality and the passion for justice, what will happen is that a group of people will be born who are enormously strong and who are incorruptible by the madness and illusion of the world. So when you bring together the deepest, most urgent action on behalf of justice and harmony with deep inner practice, a new force is born that in extraordinary and difficult circumstances can change 
everything. And we've seen it change everything. We saw it in India with Gandhi. We saw it in, with Martin Luther King. We saw it. We've seen how powerful a spirit based action can be in transforming situations which seem intractable. So my work for 20 years now has been to formulate the laws of sacred activism and to teach them everywhere and to write about them, but also to bring in the other key, which is what we've done in Radical Regeneration, which is that sacred activism is part of a massive evolutionary shift that human beings are being asked to do. Because it shows us that it's not enough to act. You have to act wisely and guidedly in sacred inspiration. And it shows us that it's not just enough to pray and to have beautiful experiences. You've got to put what you are given by the divine into action. So it's saying to both mystics as they are and activists as they are, you're not aligned. Mystics, you're not aligned because you're drunk on transcendence. Get real, get down, get active. Activists, you're not aligned because you've rejected spirituality. You need the wisdom of shadow work. You need the wisdom of joy. You need the strength of knowing who you are to do the immense, wonderful work that you're doing. And slowly, people in both camps are getting it. And the last thing I'd like to say is that this is not just the birth of a very powerful force that can transform it. It's the birth of yourself as an immensely powerful person. Because when you fuse together deep mystical practice with the commitment to urgent action, you become a permanent revolutionary of love in action. And you cannot be corrupted. You can't be hijacked. You can't be put into a box. You're out of the box. You're expressing the power and the joy and the creativity of the new human. You're very dangerous, in fact, to all the old structures and fantasies, both religious and political, which is why this marriage has been tried to be prevented, but it cannot be prevented any longer. It's happening all over the world, and enormous results are possible through its fusion. And I would just like to add that um, Radical Regeneration is not a book of just a lot of theories. We have given you tons of practices in this book. And if you do, you know, not all of the practices, uh, you know, maybe not, uh, or if you begin to be willing to engage with the practices, they will automatically perform this marriage in your heart, this marriage of the activist and the mystic. Wow. I would just offer that uh, this is a very practical book. You offer many wonderful practical exercises in there. One that comes to mind for me is that you suggest spending more time in nature. And if you have a pet or there's an animal that you connect with or want to connect with, to be present with that animal and that that can work on your heart. Absolutely. Yes, every night, um, in, at the end of my day, usually my day is filled with, you know, interviews like this or writing or, you know, producing my daily news digest, something that really makes me think about what's going on in the world. And, you know, toward the end of the day, I just don't want to do that. You know, I just want to chill and prepare for going to rest for the night. And so I have this, this wonderful love seat and the name is no accident because next to me is my dog Gordon. And we just have this wonderful time of snuggling and being together. And sometimes, you know, I'll be streaming a video and he'll be laying there snoring beside me, you know, and it's so delightful. And it just takes me to this deeper, deeper place within myself and 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 also makes me want to help animals which i do you know in different ways makes me you know want to care about what's happening with animals who are who are parts of nature like we are you know we forget that we are animals
animals are the real victims of our situation. Yes. And in addressing the horror, which is what our third book, our third movement in the book is, Saving Animals from Ourselves, we make that very, very clear. You use the phrase engoldenment in your book. Can you share what that is? Engoldenment is the highest level of evolutionary transformation that we know of. And it has appeared in various beings throughout human history as a sign, I believe, of where we are going. And fundamentally, engoldenment is the turning to divine gold of consciousness, of your mind, your heart, your soul, and what is most extraordinary, your body. Because the evolutionary mystics of all the traditions have known that as the mystical journey gets more and more profound, it gets more and more embodied. Your body actually becomes different. It becomes infinitely supple and more plastic and filled with light. It becomes love's body. And that is engoldenment. And why it's so important in our book is because we believe that what these beings have experienced and written about is a great clue to the next stage that's being opened up to humanity through the dark night. A stage which won't just be what people call enlightenment, where you have understanding of reality and clarity and warmth and joy and compassion, but actually you'll be mutated. You'll be a different kind of human being with access to enormously greater creative energies in every part of your being, including your body, your transformed body. It's amazing stuff, but it's not something we invented in the bath. It's something that I've been excavating from the heart of the mystical systems now for 20 years and feel ready to present in the way that we've done so in the book. And it's having a tremendous impact. I'm happy to say this book is really reaching thousands of people and thousands of people are really hearing its message that we're in, in something much vaster than the transformation. We're in a mutation process. And the secret to that mutation process is engoldenment. Is there anything else either of you would like to share about resilience in dangerous times or any last messages here today that can provide some inspiration for those listening? I would like to cl close with a couple of lines from Mary Oliver. We shake with grief. We shake with joy. What a time these two have, housed as they are in the same body. Beautiful. I just love to quote Rumi. Passion burns down every branch of exhaustion. Passion is the supreme elixir and renews all life. So don't sigh heavily, your brow bleak with cynicism and boredom. Dare to look for passion, 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 passion. Run, my friends, from all false solutions. Let divine passion triumph and rebirth you in yourself. Wow. Thank you both so much for your love, joy, passion, compassion for all of us, the earth, the animals that we are ourselves. Thank you both so much for being with me today. Thank you. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.